that will be presented now is the result of uh, an activity that I have been leading for the past three years, in which we have extended a method for measuring the severity of food insecurity that is used in the United States since 1995 and in several other countries in the world, especially in Latin America, we have ported it to the global level. So, essentially the idea was that we have something that we know it works well in a specific context. Could it work in a different context and is there a way of making uh, the prevalence of food insecurity measure the different level of severity to be truly comparable across countries. So that when we speak of people facing a severe food insecurity condition would mean the same thing both in the US or in Uganda or in Brazil or everywhere. The pro project is called the Voices of the Hungry. The idea, the name comes from the fact that this is based on personal interviews in which people speak their voice and that's why Voices of the Hungry. How this has been applied to the problem of measuring food insecurity and a presentation of the results that we have been achieving so far by using the Gallup World Poll, which is an international uh, private company that conducts uh, uh, every year a World Poll survey interviewing 160,000 people throughout the world with a set of common questionnaires. Essentially, we have purchased sample space into the Gallup World Poll to administer a very short questionnaire of eight questions, and we have received the data. And what I will present is the result of having analyzed this data. And uh, the final, the latest innovation is that we have presented this work to the representative of the research community and of the statistical community throughout the world. And one of the results is that when we have proposed that this could be a valid method to monitor the target 2.1, this has been accepted and endorsed by the Statistical Commission. So now the prevalence of food insecurity experienced by households or by adults, and that's uh, just the detail, using computed using the FIS, is one of the indicators that is being endorsed for global monitoring. And the proposition is that this could be adopted by any country because the major quality of this measure, the vastly bigger quality of this method is the cost effectiveness. Is the very limited cost when compared to the depth and detail of information it can produce. So, my objective is to explain to you why I am convinced that this is a good idea. So, first of all, when we measure something, we have to keep in mind that there is a difference between the attribute and the object that we measure. We don't measure a person. We measure the height of a person, or the weight of a person, or the age. So, even though the person is the object, or the household is the object, the attribute that we measure needs to be identified in order to, to evaluate whether or not the measurement tool is an appropriate one. Because there may be tools that are appropriate for some attribute, but not for others. I cannot use a scale to measure the height of an individual. Sorry, made it too. I, I need a scale to measure the weight. I need the ruler to measure the height. So the tool is specific to the attribute. And so we needed an act, a measurement tool for a specific attribute. And the attribute is the severity of the food insecurity condition. Still a little bit of definition, a measurement system is a combination of a measurement tool 
a protocol that guides the application of the tool, and then a standard of reference that can be used to calibrate the measurement tool in order to produce uh, comparable estimates. So this is very common in the engineering, uh, in the metrology sector, in which every time somebody devises a new measurement tool, there is a, a standard of reference, and there is also an institution, usually the ISO, the UNI, that guarantee and maintain the standard, so that you have to have a certification of the calibration of the tool. So these things have never been used very much in the social sciences. But my claim is that it would be healthy to learn about this idea of the need to have a proper protocol, a standard of reference, so that the measurement system in its own can be evaluated. And this is the, the, the fact, is that if we don't have a reference standard, and somebody that maintains that reference standard and that ensures that the calibration is done properly, it will be impossible to, to maintain that the measures are comparable. So, this is what we aim to do, is to apply the tools according to a certain protocol, obtain the, the measure. Uh, okay, I'll, I'll keep this. Sometimes I've seen uh, index scores, things that are expressed as numbers, with the claim that because they are expressed as numbers, I can take averages, I can compare them, but that's not enough. It's not enough to express something as a number to claim that this is a measure. A measure is something more. So, what is that? defines the validity of a measurement, and this is a claim, this is taken from uh, literature in the psychometric uh, field, and also in the other areas of uh, social uh, research like the educational testing. And we say that a measurement system is valid if there is a precise causal relationship between the attribute that I am intending to measure and the, the figure the digits that the measurement system uh, restitute, produces. So every time there is a change in the attribute, the measurement system should produce a different figure in, with the, where the change in the figure is in the, the same direction and the same proportion of the change of the attribute. So every time the food insecurity condition worsens, this measurement system should produce a higher number and the proportion of change should be reflected in the proportion of change in the measure. Now this is interesting because sometimes, for example, anthropometric children uh, development is taken as a measure of food security. But I want, I want to ask you, is it true that every time there is a change in the food security situation of a household, there is a corresponding change in the anthropometric of children, but also every change in the anthropometric of children is necessarily related to a change in the food security, or maybe to health, maybe to nutrition, education, maybe to other things. So this is to say that many indicators of food insecurity are not necessarily measures of the severity of the food insecurity. Interesting indicators, but still one step short from the measures. The second aspect is the reliability of a measure, and the reliability of a measure has to do with measurement error. Now, I have been speaking for hours about the prevalence of undermeasurement. Never once in the history of FAO, the extent of measurement error around the prevalence of undermeasurement has ever been published. So I'm culprit myself of the fact that if we don't have an indication of the measurement error, we cannot assess how reliable are the measures. And when you don't have a gold standard, when you have to measure something that cannot be observed directly, then 
reliability is a problem and the only way in which you can assess the reliability is by through <coughs> an assessment of the statistical property of the measurement system. And you can only speak of probability of being biased or the variance of the error theoretically based on the quality of the measurement system and usually you can only do statistical tests of the bias or of the a certain uh, amplitude of the error. So in the social science measurement is particularly difficult because the attributes are usually unobservable latent constructs competence, intelligence, ability. Those are things that cannot be observed directly on a physical object. Uh, and food insecurity and the severity of food insecurity we suggest, we propose is of the same type, a latent trait, something that exists, makes sense to say that somebody is more or less food insecure than another. So you can conceive the underlying measurement scale, comparison scale, but you cannot observe it. And this is only one of the problems. The data, we have discussed extensively of the data. And the definition of the attribute, maybe the attribute is defined while we try to measure. And this is, has been the case for food security, which has been a very dynamic concept that has evolved over time and has been having different definition in different moments. So, the bottom line is that we need to give very heightened attention to the statistical property of the tools when we apply it in the area of social sciences. So, the RASH model is a very simple logistic regression, essentially. So, imagine that you have a latent trait in which both items and the uh, object Sorry, uh, I have to clarify what the items are and what the objects are. But you have a scale in which you can position both an item and a respondent, and based on the distance between the item and the respondent, you can define the probability that the particular responder will respond in a certain way to the particular item. Let me simplify. The way we are in also in an academic uh, realm, how do we grade our students? How do we evaluate the relative competence or ability of different students? We administer tests. A test is usually a set of questions. Questions are of different difficulties. And then we see, we observe the response to the test, how the student responds to the test. And depending on how many questions the student responds to correctly, depending on the relative difficulty of the questions, we come up with a grade. That's exactly the principle that we use. And what the model says is that the larger, the bigger is the difference, the distance between the ability of the respondent and the difficulty of the question, the more likely is that we have a positive answer. So the more competent is a student and the more simple, easy is the question, the higher is the probability that the response will be correct. And this is the only thing that the Rush model does, is to impose a monotonic function. This is a simple logistic function, is a linear in the odds. So the chances of getting correct divided by the chances of uh, not being correct is a linear function of the distance on the scale. So we can call A the parameter of the uh, 
of the respondent be the parameter of the item, and what is matter is the distance between A and B. And given this structure, whenever I have a data set on the responses to a set of items, by applying a maximum likelihood procedure, I can estimate the parameters A and B of the model. Not only, I can also conduct statistical tests of fit to see how well the responses uh, fit the assumption that indeed the way in which they respond is, don't, is uh, dictated, driven by this model. Uh, one interesting quality of the Rush model is that if the Rush model is consistent with the data, so if the data are, do not reject the assumption that are behind the Rush model, then the simple row score, which is the sum of the positive answers, is already a sufficient statistics to estimate the severity parameter. And uh, I know this seems abstract, but it's a very useful uh, result because it makes the application in practice of the method very, very simple. So that assuming that you have applied a scale and then the result pass the Rush model test, then the only data processing that you have to do is counting the number of yes. And this is already in itself an indicator of <coughs> the severity of the underlying latent trend, the size of the underlying latent trend. Conditional maximum likelihood, there are also other ways, this is uh, some details. I'm trying to give you a heuristic illustration of what it does. Imagine you have eight different items and you have n different respondents, and we have coded the responses for one for a yes and zero for a no. So this is how your data matrix will look like. Very simple. So what the Rush model does is like, first, computing the average of each column. Now, with a dichotomous variable, the average is simply the proportion of ones. So this means that 0.95 for the first item is that 95% of the respondent have said yes to that question, and only 5% have said no. On the extreme end, only 22% of the respondent have said yes to the last item, and the rest have said no. So what does information this? What kind of information this data can convey? Now, if it is true that respondent and items are positioned on the same scale of severity, the very fact that 95% have reported the experience associated with the first item or 95 of the students have responded correctly to the first question, means that the first item corresponds to a relatively milder condition, or that the first question is the easiest one. So the order in which we rank the items is based on the proportion of positive response. So already I can order the item, sorry, go in the wrong direction, so that now I need to switch item 3 and 4 and move item 5 almost to the back, so that now the order is the relative order of severity. I don't know, let me show this again. I have asked the question in a certain order, so number one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, and eight is the order in which I've asked the question, the order in which they are listed in the questionnaire. But then from the result, I recognize that item four is of a less severity than item three, and that item five is more severe than item seven. So I'm switching them so that now the order is 
the relative order of 70, as revealed by the data. Is it clear? Now, let's do another um, reorganization, this time of the lines, so the respondent. And I want to rank the respondent that have the highest row score. You see the last column is the sum. And so I've ordered them in decreasing order of row score. And now, let's look at specific patterns of response. For example, the second line of a respondent that has a row score of 6 there has responded yes to the first 6 question and no to the last 2 question. What can I infer from that? If it is true that the probability of responding depends on the distance this individual will have, will be positioned on the scale of severity somewhere between the severity associated with item number 7 and the severity associated with item number 5. It's like logic dictates that if I am of a certain level of competencies, I will respond correctly to the easy question up to a certain point. And then when we start failing the difficult question. And my competence level is somewhere in between. The difficulty of the last question I responded correctly and the difficulty of the first question I responded wrongly. So that's exactly what's the logic behind this. I can locate the respondent based on the row score. But now there is a problem. Look at the two lines that have row score 4 or the two lines that have row score 3. So there is a different number of patterns that would generate the same row score. And in particular, sorry, I went to, unfortunately the color don't come up through. But what I've done here is that highlighted the responses that are in the wrong place. Like respondent number five said yes to the first, the second, and the fourth question, but said no to the third question. And said no to the sixth, seventh, but then said yes to the fifth question and no to the eighth. So there is two inconsistencies. I would have expected a yes in the third column and a no in the uh, seventh column. So what do I do? How do I use this information? On one side, I would like to say that this person is positioned on a less severe uh, position because of that no to the relatively uh, mild condition. So that would push my estimate to the left. But on the other hand, I want to say something that is severe because he has also reported the uh, penultimate uh, condition, which is a more severe one. So this took balance. And the best I can say is still that the position of this individual is Again, at equivalent to a row score of 4, with a difference that of the two lines with row score 4, the first one has less measurement error than the second one. I am a little bit more confident on the position of respondent number 4 than on the position of respondent number 5. So, even though it's the same measure, the second has a broader confidence interval. I don't know if this is clear enough, but this is essentially everything that the RASH model does. Assuming that there is a scale in which we can measure the severity both of the item and the respondent, 
and I can associate a measure of severity to each responder based on the pattern of response. And there will be some pattern of response that are more imprecise than others. But now look at another thing. If I look at this data from the perspective of the columns, so I go back now and I want to scrutinize did this item work well? And uh, if I count the number of times the response to a certain item are out of place, so the red responses, I may find that some items did not work well. Some items, in a sense, the way the student responded to that test item is independent of the competence as revealed by the other items. So it's like I made a wrong choice, and this happened to all of us when we are instructor. Either I made a mistake in the text of the test so that the student didn't understand, or they, the, the language was not good. So the way in which people have responded to that is independent of the severity where they are. And so this is one way of identifying items that in principle were expected to work but did not work. And I will have an example in the food security uh, application of this kind of items. Like for example, let me give it because it may help. Uh, there have been cases in which, in order to reveal the food insecurity situation of people, one of the questions was, did you ever beg for food, or did you ever steal for food? Did you ever have to procure food in a shameful way? On the assumption that that might be a condition in which people are forced if they are very desperate. So, in principle, it makes sense. But what is the problem? That if it is a shameful way of procuring food, do you think that people would faithfully report? People would be even more ashamed of reporting it. So they will not report it faithfully. And this type of question was tested in uh, uh, the initial application of something that is called the Household Food Insecurity Access Scheme. And the test, the statistical test, revealed that this question doesn't work. And so it was excluded. And what is the result? So when we apply a measurement scale based on the RASH model, we will have two sets of parameters. One severity level or measurement level for each of the item, each of the questions, and one severity level for each of the row scores. So that can be assigned to the various uh, individuals. So if I want to be very, very discriminating uh, among the respondents, I need to have a large number of items so that I can discriminate more finely across the respondents. And the respondent parameter, this row score, is an ordinary measure of severity. So if it's an application to good security, I can say that those who reported row score 8 are more severely food insecure than those who report, reported row score 7, and so on. And this is the way the tool has been applied in the United States, in Mexico, in Brazil, in which the questionnaire is applied, the rush validation is tested, and then respondents are classified based on the row score. So you set the threshold, you define that row score 7 or more means severe food insecurity, and you can compute the prevalence of food insecurity at that level of severity by counting the proportion of those with row score 7 or 8. And you can apply it several times over time, keeping the consistent threshold, and you have consistent classification. So, this is the RASH model. We have applied it to uh, food security. It's not an invention, because as I said, it's been done in the US, in Brazil, 
in uh, Spanish-speaking Latin American countries, and uh, also in Asia and in Africa through the initiative of the FANTA, the Food and Nutrition Technical Assistance Program of USA. And then here we come, which is a synthesis of all the experience of this other food. These are the questions. And now the key point, what are these questions intended to reveal is objectual condition, facts. So we are not asking people their opinion on whether or not they feel themselves deprived or if they would rent themselves as poor or would self-assess themselves as food insecure. No. Those would be subjective questions. We have identified a number of conditions that people should be able to relate to, understand, and report a simple yes or no. Did it happen or not? So it's a self-reported experience, self-reported condition. Now, the issue that will come out is that some of these questions do have a certain element of potential subjectivity. Like, for example, when you ask, was during the last 12 months, was there a time when you were unable to get eat, to eat healthy and nutritious food? Then people may have different perception of what healthy and nutrition means. And this might be a problem that they interpret a different a question in a different way. But what we are asking is not, is the food that you eat healthy? Is the food that you eat nutrition? We are not measuring the nutritional knowledge of the people. We know that people will have their own perception of what is healthy. What we are asking is, did it happen that you could not get the food that you think you are, was good for you? What we are after is the intensity of the constraint they faced in accessing food. So for some reason, you were not able to get the food that otherwise you would have liked to. So, in a sense, what is important, and this brings to the linguistic adaptation, that the crucial part of question number two is not the healthy and nutritious part. You might ask this is a different way. Well, was there a time that you could not get good food? food that you think is good for you. So finding a way in which the real concept behind the question is asked. So we believe, and we believed before embarking in this research, that this would be relatively easy question to ask and to have meaningful responses. But we didn't know. One of the advantages of the Gallup World Poll is that the survey is administered in local languages. And they did provide the service of translating this questionnaire in more than 200 different languages. And the way they do is to they start from a master, which is either in English or in Spanish, uh, and then get a translation and an independent back translation to verify that there are no problems. In some cases where we could, for example, Vikas helped us with the, some of the languages in the, used in India, we could also provide our own uh, suggestion on improving the translation. We applied it in 140, 47 different countries, areas or territories, and we obtained the results that I want to comment. So we applied this in 2014 for the first time in the entire world, and we have also applied it in 2015, and we are applying it in 2016. But I will only present the result of the first application. So one of the questions that was raised is, OK, these are difficult to answer. People will refuse to answer because these are intrusive questions. People don't want to report. So you will have a lot of missing values. Nothing of the sort. The number of times that we had to exclude a case because we had missing responses was very, very, very low. 
only 7% of the, of the cases have more than 1% of respondents with no valid case. So this proven to be easy to answer in the context of the Gallup World Poll Survey is a face-to-face -face interview that lasts a maximum of 40 minutes. In some countries, and this means the developed countries, where the phone penetration is more than 80%, it's done on the phone. But all developing countries were done face to face. Second, I, I didn't go into the detail of the uh, infit and outfit statistics, but in a way, this is an indicator of the quality of the item. Remember, counting the number of red responses. And when the infit statistics is between 0 0.8 and 1.2, this is loosely related to a chi-square statistic. So the ideal value is 1. 0 0.8, 1.2 is considered optimal. It's considered very good fit. And you see the percentage of times in which that particular question had very good fit. So overall, very good quality. 93, 96, 98% of the time that item had a, an acceptable or a very good or good fit. So these results were surprisingly, surprisingly good for us. And it goes to the testimony of the fact that Gallup does a good job in administering a survey. One uh, okay, I'll skip this. There is one interesting aspect of the analysis of this uh, rush model based measure is whether or not you are capturing more than one dimensions at a time. If you are asking questions that reveal different things, this might be a problem. To do so, we analyze the residuals that you have after you have taken out the first dimension and we see that there is no significant residuals, correlation in the residuals. So we are confident that these are all questions related to the same concept. And based on the content of the question, this concept is the severity of the food insecurity condition. Another doubt that some of the commentary had is these are subjective, Questions that will reveal only the way in which people position themselves relative to others. If that is the case, you will have distribution in different countries that are very similar. Because everyone will compare themselves to their known environment, and so there will be roughly one third in one hand one-third in the middle, one-third in the other hand. So somebody told us, don't bother, because I can tell you, we'll have always the same distribution, centered around the middle, with 30% of low level, 30% of the level. Quite the contrary. With these tools, we have been able to detect cases in which almost everyone had moderate or severe food insecurity, and cases in which nobody had any severe food insecurity. <coughs> we have applied it, as I say, throughout the world. There are cases like 2014 in uh, Sierra Leone, Liberia, countries heavily affected by the Ebola crisis, in which virtually everyone had some problem with food. And there are other countries in which people, report, only very few reported to have had this experience. So this debunk the risk that these are subjective measures. And these are a sense of the distribution of countries. But we want to check whether or not the result makes sense. And one way of looking at them is say, okay, if we rank countries based on this index, how do ranking compare with the ranking that will be obtained using other indicators of development. So we took the bacterial indicators that form the uh, Human Development Index, 
and we run for the countries in which we could match the uh, Spearman correlation index. And you see that all correlation indexes are significantly different from zero in the right direction, and in some cases there are very strong correlation, like with child mortality, with uh, access to sanitation facility, with the overall human development index. In some cases we have a problem, for example, with the children anthropometric measure, but in part this is because the children anthropometric measure was available not for 2014, but for two, three, four, five years earlier. And here the causality goes in the wrong direction because I would expect that if household face food insecurity now, in two years I will find more stunted and wasted children, but to link stunting and wasting three years ago to the food insecurity now is not the right thing to do. So, unfortunately, we don't have contemporaneous data on other indicators to run the analysis. But nevertheless, this was a very convincing evidence that we are on the right track, that with this very simple indicator, we can rank countries in a meaningful way. But then the next question was, well, don't waste time, you're just measuring extreme poverty in a different way. Because the ability to access food is essentially monetary poverty. But we strongly believe that that is not the case, but we needed to explore the possibility. So the way we devised to do is say, okay, let's try and see whether we can explain differences across countries in child mortality rate, for example, by the prevalence of undernourishment, the prevalence of food insecurity, and the extreme poverty. So in a regression setting like this, if it is true that the prevalence of food insecurity only captures poverty, it must be the case that if we put both poverty and food insecurity in the same regression, one of the two will disappear. And this is the, the evidence that it's not the case. Even controlling for extreme poverty, the prevalence of food insecurity has a strong explanatory power in explaining child mortality rate. So, I think that this set of results were even surprisingly good for us, to the point that has convinced FAO to release them. And so we will now propose to use these indicators to monitor the severity of food insecurity in a way that is fully consistent with the concept behind the target, ensure access to food. And this is a measure of the ability to access food. Uh, there are several qualities that, if applied in an individual-based survey, we can distinguish between men and women. So everything else, whether the prevalence of food insecurity is larger among women or men, and the need of disaggregating uh, indicators is very important. 